Good morning. This is an exciting Sunday to be here, the Sunday where we uh, reached and exceeded our Christmas offering. And uh, we're going to see what God does between now and January 31st. If you're newer around Hope, uh, one of the things that you don't know is that the family uh, that we highlighted this week, the Gouldy family, they were once part of us. Uh, they were a part of Hope Church for a number of years. Uh, many of those kids that you saw were born here while they were at Hope Church. Uh, Jeff completed our Antioch Project, uh, which is a program for training for men and women who feel called into vocational ministry. And then a number of years ago, uh, we sent them out for them to answer the call of ministry. So it's exciting to be able to partner with people who were once among us and a part of Hope who... God's called them to continue his work in other places. Well, today we're continuing this brand new series that we started last week called The Faithful Steward. And uh, last week we sort of set the stage. What is stewardship? Why is stewardship important? And before we move into the first two specific areas that we're called to faithfully steward, I want to just look back at a few of those points of context, some of the foundation that we laid. And the reason I want to go back before we go forward is we're going to build today on what we uh, looked at last week. And we're going to continue to build on this throughout the rest of the series. Last week, I introduced you to the theme verse for this series found in 1 Corinthians 4.2. And uh, I want to invite you, would you all read this out loud with me? Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Very good. So that's hence the name of the series, The Faithful Steward. Uh, I shared as we began last week a couple of warnings and a couple of disclaimers that I also want to mention. Uh, one was that depending on your age or your stage of life, this series as a whole and each specific message it may stir up some different things in your own life. It may give you a different experience than maybe even the person sitting next to you who is of a different age or a different stage of life. I particularly challenged our younger members of the audience, our students, we got a couple up here, uh, here in this front row, and there's a few more of you here that pay attention closely to what we're talking about. And the reason is, is because the younger you are, the more of life you had to have ahead of you. You have more time to be a faithful steward. And then I also shared with you that, you know, the reason that we're doing this series is not because you all are such awful stewards. In fact, many of you are really good stewards, but the reason that we're doing this is because we all need this. In our spiritual growth and development, we never arrive. You can always be more faithful. And, and what I'm sharing with you, uh, I need it just as much as you do because individually we're followers of Jesus on our own journey with him, but collectively we are this local outpost of God's kingdom. And as we are faithful stewards together, we can participate and we can be a part of what God is doing. So what is a steward? Here, here's the quick recap. Here's the first part. Stewards are not the owner, but the one who has been entrusted with the responsibility to use, maintain, protect, and expand what belongs to the owner in line with his goals and for his gain. So the key thing is stewards are managers, not owners. The steward doesn't own the things that they have been entrusted with. And for us as Christ followers, we talked for a bit about the fact that stewardship is part of lordship. For Jesus to be our Lord simply means he's the boss, he's the director, he's the one that calls the shots in our life. So everything at our disposal, our entire life, every area of our life, if Jesus is Lord, then it's all under his lordship. So as we are faithful stewards, we're doing it in line with what Jesus wants. Then we said, as a follower of Jesus, I'm called uh, to be a kingdom steward, which is wisely and faithfully managing everything God has entrusted to me in line with his purposes and for his glory. And then we looked at the parable of the talents found in the New Testament book of Matthew, and we looked at four principles of stewardship. 
And these four principles of stewardship apply directly to money, but not just to money. They apply to all the areas that we're called to steward. There's ownership, responsibility, accountability, and reward. And then we wrapped things up last time talking about the two most important days to steward. And those two most important days, first is today, because today is really all we have. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And the second day is that day, or judgment day, the day that we go to, be, to, to end this life. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we're going to go be with Jesus. And in fact, Romans 14 reminds us that each of us will give a personal account to God for how we have lived this life, what we have done with this life that he has given us. And then as I was thinking about this topic of stewardship, I was reflecting back on Uh, If you were here in the fall, we spent an extended amount of time in the book of Ephesians. We had a series called The Good Life. And and one of the big themes that we can draw out of the book of Ephesians is, is this. Is that because of who we are in Christ, I'm called to live a very different kind of a life from the world around me. And that fits in really good with stewardship. As a follower of Jesus, the way that I think about everything that God has entrusted me with, I'm called to think about it and to experience it in a very different way from the world around me. I I am a steward. So with that context uh, set or reminded from last time, now we want to move to uh, the first two specific areas that we're called to be a faithful steward. Uh, You can see at the top of your notes, today we're going to be looking at time and talents, but I want to start with time, and and I want to look at some truths about my time. So here's the first truth. It's limited and therefore my most precious resource. See, things that are limited are very precious. We have to use them wisely. If something, if there's an unlimited supply of something, well then there's, well, I got an unlimited supply of it. I got this and this and this, but time is not that way. It's limited. It's our most precious resource. Let's look at Psalm 90, 12. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. If you were here last time, I I mentioned there's this interesting progression that happens that when we start out early in life, what do we have? We have more time, but we typically don't have much talent, much treasure, much truth, or many relationships. But as, as time, as our time on this planet goes along and we have had more time go by, we typically gain in talents, treasure, truth, and relationship. But while the other four are increasing, The first one, time, is actually decreasing. We have less and less of it. Another truth is this. Everyone has the same amount of time given to them each day. Isn't it interesting that we may not all have the same number of days, but within a day, we all have the same amount of time. There's 24 hours in a day, or 1,440 minutes, or 86,000 seconds. In fact, there was a song from the early 2000s with an interesting line in it. And and here's here's that line. Let's put it up on the screen. And life is like an hourglass glued to the table. You see, with an hourglass, which you can actually see time passing, when the top is emptied, you simply turn it over and you have another hour. But if the hourglass is glued to the table, what does that mean? That's all the time you have. You've just got one life. So this one life we have, we can't be reset. And when we think about the time, we all have the same amount of hours in a day, but I think it's pretty safe to say we don't all use those hours the same, right? Some people are better stewards of the passing time that they have. So I've heard it said, some waste time. A few people will, inve- will spend it, but others will uh, invest time in what truly matters. So as you think about that, you think about the time that you have, just a, a brief reflection question for you is, 
generally speaking, are you a time waster? Are you a time spender? Or are you an investor of the time? And as you think about that, I have a a couple of interesting quotes I found. Here are the quotes. The first, time is what we want most, but what we use the worst. I know none of you have ever done that. And then, look at, lost time is never found again. You know, anybody here lose your keys, right? Anybody lost your keys this morning? Well, if you're here, you found them or you found the second set. So when we lose a thing, we can find it. But when it comes to time, once it's lost, it's not found. Then I I just found this quote yesterday I want to share with you. Experience proves that most time is wasted not in hours but in minutes. A bucket with a small hole at the bottom gets just as empty as a bucket that is deliberately kicked over. Isn't that interesting when we think about the wasting of our time? So time, once it's gone, it's gone. But actually those other four, we can get more of it. Now, it's easier for some to get more money than others. But if you buy something and it turns out that, well, that was a waste of money, right? Maybe you went to this great new restaurant that people were raving about. And, well, that was the worst meal I've ever had. And whatever you spent on that, you can get more money back. You can gain more truth over time. and, And you can get more friends but time is gone when it's gone so here's another truth about time there's two ways to look at time two ways to think about it there's chronos and kairos these are greek words that talk about different types of time so chronos is the hours and the minutes and the seconds it's the the passing of measured time it's it's the time that's literally going by as the sand moves in this hourglass. And this is what we typically pay the most attention to. You know, we're somewhere and we're like, how long is this gonna take? How much time is it going to take? But then there's another type of time, Kairos. This is the seasons, seasons of opportunity. Look, at this is the same landscape in each of the four different seasons. And notice that it looks very different. There are different seasons of opportunity that we have in our life and in even in a given day. And the challenge for us is this when we think about these two different types of time is how do we make plans with our calendar, the chronos, and then we hold a loose grip on those plans so that as the Holy Spirit brings opportunities throughout our day, we can actually take advantage of those opportunities and we can be obedient to those opportunities rather than so tightly, God, that's not in my plans for today. And I think with time, this is one of those places where we see the intersection between God's sovereignty and our responsibility. I want to show you how that works together. God is the one who brings opportunities. That's, that's his job. He brings opportunities to us every day. In fact, the truth is, we've probably all had opportunities already today. It's not even noon yet. We may not have even seen all the opportunities that God has brought and across our path. So God brings the opportunities. God's also the one who is responsible for the outcomes. Then there's this bridge in the middle, which is obedience. This is my responsibility my responsibility to be obedient to act accordingly with the opportunities that God brings so that I can be a part of the outcomes that he's bringing to pass in fact we see this in a couple of different places one we see this very clearly when it comes to sharing our faith with others God brings an opportunity throughout our day and Oftentimes, it comes at what looks like an inconvenient time for us, right? God brings an opportunity to have a conversation with someone where we can share our faith with them. We can share the difference that Jesus has made in our life, why we have the hope that we have, why that with the world looking the way that it looks right now, we're not completely wigged out. Why are you so calm? Why are you so peaceful? Why do you have hope? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about that. But that... 
wasn't in your plans for the day but that was an opportunity that God brought and then the outcome whether or not that person decides to follow Jesus at the end of that conversation or that person decides to follow Jesus ever that's not up to you that's up to God we never have saved anybody we've had conversations we've shared truth but God is responsible for the outcome however we have a responsibility to be obedient to act it with, in line with the opportunity God brings. A second example, and this is a, this is a, a really exciting uh, couple of weeks for us here at Hope, and this has to do with the Christmas offering, right? So we, we do this annual Christmas offering where we, w- we have a chance to be a part of what God is doing here locally in Fort Worth in Tarrant County and what he's doing around our country and even uh, globally around the world. So God has provided the opportunity to be a part of his kingdom work through this Christmas offering. And God is actually the one in charge of the outcome. And we, we have a 12-week season that our Christmas offering is open and we best we can through prayer and looking at things we come up with a goal. But God's ultimately the one responsible for the outcome. And guess what? Our goal was too small, right? God's doing something. We don't know what yet. Uh, We'll find out by the, on the 31st of January, all of what God wants to do, what the total outcome that he wants to be. Now, so part of the answer to the question of why do we not just celebrate and wrap up the Christmas offering today is because this obedience part here in the middle. I'll just speak for my own life. I told you this uh, when we launched the Christmas offering back in November, that God gave me a number that he wanted me to be a part of for this Christmas offering. And and what I did is I brought my best gift first when we opened the Christmas offering, but I couldn't do that whole number when we opened the Christmas offering. But what I can do is I can give a little bit each week, and that's what I'm doing. I've still got a couple more weeks left to give. So if for no other reason, we're keeping the Christmas offering open so that I can be obedient to what God has called me to do. Now, if you find yourself in a similar place, if, if God gave you a number and right now you're thinking, well, we already, uh, we already exceeded the goal that God really want me to do that, I would invite you to go with what God gave you. And let's see what this outcome will be when we get to January 31st. Well, I came across a story that I think it beautifully illustrates the difference between the Kronos and the Kairos challenge. But I want to warn you, this story is one of those stories that has this gut punch of truth in it, okay? So here's the story. Charles Francis Adams, he's the son of President John Quincy Adams and the grandson of President John Adams. So we're talking about Charles Francis Adams here. Here's a picture of him. He kept a diary, And one day he entered this in his diary. Went fishing with my son today. A day wasted. His youngest son, Brooks Adams. Here's a picture of Brooks. He made an entry on that same day to his own diary, which is still in existence. And on that same day, here's what Brooks wrote. Went fishing with my father the most wonderful day of my life. You see, the father thought he was wasting time while fishing with his son, but his son saw it as an investment of time. Same time observed from two different perspectives. One saw it as a waste, the other saw it as something significant. One saw just chronos, the hours, minutes and seconds, and the loss of them. The other saw Kairos, something special, a unique opportunity. And after I read that story, I, I, I sat and I, I pondered for a few minutes. And the question I was asking myself where it was the, the gut punch for me was, how many times have I thought I was wasting time because I wasn't checking off something on my to-do list? Yet what was actually happening was I was making an investment in someone's life. And how many times have I done that to my own children or my own wife? Two different ways to look at time. Which leads us to 
The last truth is that this, is that as a steward, I must make choices about what is important. See, we can't do everything. You heard of FOMO? Fear of missing out? Like, we think we can do everything. We have to do everything, but we can't do everything. We all have the same 24 hours in a day, and we've got to make choices. Again, when we last fall had our series the good life looking at the book of ephesians we looked at ephesians 5 15 through 17 but it's worth looking at again this morning when we consider time so here it is therefore see that you walk carefully living life with honor purpose and courage shunning those who tolerate and enable evil not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. You see, simply the will of the Lord for our time is that we choose things that are in line with his plans. We choose things that are in line with his purposes. We choose things that are pleasing to him. But the challenge we have as Christ followers is increasingly shifting from the temporal to the eternal. Look again at Psalm 90, 12. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. You see, knowing the brevity of life, knowing that we just have this one life to live, that we have only today to steward, but we need to be stewarding today in light of eternity. We seek, wisdom is seeking the eternal over the temporal. And and I love the way that Ken Boas says this, this phrase. He says, to pursue the unseen over the seen and the not yet over the than now what is faith we don't live by sight right we live by faith and it's really hard I mean at a practical level to pursue the unseen over the seen but I can see that thing right there it's it looks so interesting so enticing I want it but to not pursue that and to pursue the unseen thing further well that's a choice to pursue the unseen over the seen and the not yet over the now. You see, right now is preparation for the not yet. Whether the not yet an hour from now or the not yet in eternity. But right now is preparation for that not yet. Now maybe you're like, okay, I understand my choices are important, but how in the world do I make good choices? (laughs) So, If that's you, I want to very quickly give you a five-part framework for decision-making. But if you get the digital version of the notes, there is a link to a decision-making message that is a whole, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes about what I'm going to show you here in about 10 seconds, all right? So if you want to make better choices, it starts with this, a life characterized by prayer. Prayer's got to be a part of our life then we've got to have knowledge and understanding of God's revealed word you see when it comes to choices we make there are things God has clearly already said do it and there are other things that God has clearly already said don't do it and our, one of our problems is sometimes we sit there agonizing and pondering over should I or shouldn't I If God already said do it, then just do it. You actually don't have to think about it. If God said don't do it and stay away from it, you don't have to think about it. Don't do it and stay away from it. But then there are areas that we have freedom and you got to know what God's word says and the principles and how do you apply those to the areas of freedom. You also need to have wise people in your life that you can go to for godly counsel. It is important to evaluate your circumstances And you want to consider your emotions. But here's the problem is most of us make decisions this way. How do I feel about it? Yeah, it'll make my life easier. I want to find people who will say it. I look for a verse that validates it. And then my prayer is God bless this mess. Not very wise. We want to go this way. 
So you can check out that message if that's an area that you'd like some more help in. As we think about making wise choices, let's shift now to truths about our talent because we want to make wise choices about our talents. By the way, as we talk about talents for the next few minutes, we're not talking about the unit of money from the parable of talents. I know it might be kind of confusing that word is used in different ways, but right now we're not talking at all about money. Next week we're going to talk about being a faithful steward of our treasure, which includes money, and I'll define what I mean by talents in just a minute, but just know this, we are not talking about money, okay? So here's the first truth. God has given me talents, but he's not given everyone the same ones. I have talents, you have talents, we maybe have some similar ones, but we don't all have the same talents. In fact, God, as creator, he has made us equal in some ways and unequal in others. You ever thought about that? We've all equally been made in God's image and we have equal value as his creation. And we We've been made by him. We equally have the right to life. We equally have the right to pursue his calling and purposes in our life. But look look at Exodus 4.11. This is kind of interesting. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So God has made us equal in some ways and not equal in others. How? In case you haven't noticed, Pastor Brian, who led us in worship this morning, Pastor Luke, who was up here to welcome you, they're just a wee bit taller than me, right? Uh, Now, I've joked over the years, there's a reason that I'm not in the band, and that is because I have some talents, but none of them happen to be in the musical arena, okay? Some of you have talents in the musical arena. Obviously, the people here on stage have talents in the musical arena. I just don't. And then God gave some of us a perfectly shaped head, and he gave others of you hair. (laughs) That's another way that we're not all equal. So, what do I mean by talents? Here's what I mean. We're going to use the term talents very broadly to include three subcategories. The first subcategory is natural ability natural ability and here's a definition of natural ability for you we're talking about the inherent or innate capabilities that individuals possess without some specific training or conscious effort and and, uh, examples athletic prowess artistic uh, talent mathematical aptitude uh, natural aptitude for languages you know there, there are some kids that when they're you know just a little kid, the way that they can move their body, the way they throw a ball, the way that they climb, whatever it is, they have some natural athletic ability that the rest of us don't have, right? And then another one, I I, I have had the opportunity to travel all over the world. A previous position I had on staff, I was a pastor over missions. I've led a lot of different mission teams to a lot of different parts of the world. And for me, I'm one of those people that by the time we get to the end of our week or 10 days, whatever it is, I'm just still trying to figure out how to say please and thank you and where's the bathroom, okay? But some people, we're, we're like five hours in country and some people on the team are already speaking like practically fluent. Well, they have some natural abilities for languages, okay? That's, that's what we're talking about here. Now, let's move on to skills next. Skills, that's the second subcategory. And I'm sure some of your minds went here, so I want us to just get it out of our system. Some of you thought about this guy when I said the word skills, all right? And if you didn't think about him, maybe you thought about this guy, okay? What are we talking about with skills? Well, here's what we're talking about. These are learned or developed abilities that result from training practice and experience and the other thing with skills is over time we can grow in skills in an area even if we have no natural ability 
Some examples of this is time management. You look around at people and you say, man, they're a great manager of, of their time. It's a skill they've developed. Uh, decision making is a skill. You can get better at it. Communication, writing, cooking. In fact, you talk to somebody who's a writer, they will tell you this is a skill that they've had to work on and develop over time. And a non-writer says, I got writer's block. I, I sit down, I got nothing to write. A, a skilled writer says, well, I've trained myself that I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to start writing. And then after a time, I'm going to do some editing. I don't know if anything I wrote was good, but I'm just going to start writing. That's a skill that you can just improve upon. But this third subcategory that we're going to look at, these are spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts are uh, special abilities given to Christ followers at the moment of salvation to be used for God's glory and for ministry to others. I'm going to put on the screen a list of 26 spiritual gifts. We find these in the scripture. There's four particular passages that are listed in your notes. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, 1 Peter 4, 10. This is where we find the, many of these uh, spiritual gifts. We also find them in some other verses. That's why I've put a verse next to those. With spiritual gifts, there's not a book in the New Testament of spiritual gifts. There's not a place where we find all of them listed, but we find them throughout Scripture. Some of them are repeated. Some of them are only given once. Some of them, there's more debate on others. Is that a spiritual gift? This is, these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. What I want to do, because this is church, because we're God's people, I want to take a couple extra minutes and talk about spiritual gifts, okay? So what I'm going to share with you for the next few minutes if you download the digital version of this note sheet, you can use the QR code on here to get it later today. About in the middle of the list of recommended resources, it says spiritual gift lists and additional insights. What you see on the screens in the next couple minutes is what you'll find if you download that page. So you don't have to you know, worry about your pen catching on fire trying to write down everything we look at here. But spiritual gifts are an area sometimes with confusion and curiosity and what are we talking about? So let's just talk about this for a few minutes. So here's some additional insights. First, every follower of Jesus has one or more spiritual gift. Many believers have more than one spiritual gift and there tends to even be these clusters of spiritual gift where two or three or four might kind of work together. But every follower of Jesus, whether you know it or not, if you're a true follower of Jesus, you have at least one spiritual gift. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you have natural abilities and you have skills, but you don't have spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are actually often discovered over time gradually. So you, you may discover you have one and then you discover how you can use it and how God has intended you to use it. If you're a new follower of Jesus, you may not know yet what your spiritual gifts are. That's okay but you have them. Then spiritual gifts are not the same as the gift of the Spirit. Sometimes people refer to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives as the gift of the Spirit. Well, that happens the moment we decide to follow Jesus. The moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. He's the one that gives us the power to live this new life. That's different than spiritual gifts. It's also different from the fruit of the Spirit. We did a series last summer on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit relates to Christ-like character. This internal change that happens in our life over time the more we walk with Jesus. The gifts relate to our service in the body of Christ. And spiritual gifts are for the effective service and edification of the body. It's so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus. So three important questions, though, when it comes to spiritual gifts. If you want to know if you have spiritual gifts, the first question is, have I received the gift of salvation? Have I decided that, yes, I have a problem, that problem is sin, and I'm going to bend my knee to Jesus, I'm going to repent, I'm going to ask his forgiveness, I'm going to invite him into my life, I'm going to make him my Savior and my Lord, and he's going to direct me. If you've done that, then you have a spiritual gift. If you've not yet done that, then you don't we need to worry about spiritual gifts because you don't have a spiritual gift. You've got to be a follower of Jesus. Second question is, am I walking in fellowship 
with the Lord. See, sometimes we are genuine followers of Jesus, but we've gotten into an area of sin in our life. Maybe it's a secret area of sin that we're just... We don't want to give this thing up to him. We don't want to submit to his lordship in this area. And I'm going to hide this area of sin. If you're doing that and you are a follower of Jesus, something that you're holding back and hiding will affect your fellowship with him, which will affect the use of your spiritual gifts. And then third is, am I willing to develop my gifts? And developing it, there's sort of three steps. There's educate, exercise, and evaluate. When it comes to educate, you need a little bit of education. So here's your education. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have at least one spiritual gift. Now you need a little bit more education than that, but you don't have to study all of the gifts and worry about all this and that. You just need to know that they're there. The exercising is the most important part, and that's when we get involved and we participate in the ministry because, again, gradually over time, we discover them. And then that comes to evaluating. Well, we've got to be open to input from other godly believers in our life team leaders whoever it is they can speak into your life and they can help you see yeah you've got that that's a strength that's a weakness here's how you need to develop it and then the last thing I want to do on this kind of quick deep dive is let's look at some warnings some warnings they're not just for personal use God did not give you spiritual gift follower of Jesus for you to be awesome for you to say this is mine you remember Gollum and the precious? This is not your precious, right? Maybe we'll work a Lord of the Rings reference into each week. I don't know. We did last week. I just thought of it just now. We also don't get our spiritual gifts by merit or begging. God didn't look, you know, and say, well, look how awesome Matt is. I'm going to give him these three more spiritual gifts just because. It also doesn't work, but God, please, I don't have any musical gifting. Give it to me, please, please, I beg you. I want to be on stage. I want to sing. No, we don't get it from merit. We don't get it by begging. He gives the gifts to the ones he wants to have them because he wants them to use them for the edification of all. They can be abused. Particularly, I think the, the, the most the easiest way we abuse them is we forget why we have them. And we think it's because, look how awesome I am. Hey, did you see me? Did you see me use my gift? Did you notice? I think that's probably the way most of us can, are tempted to abuse. And then discovery is essential. Gifts shape your ministry, which impacts eternity. Do you know that as you exercise your gifts, you are having an impact on eternity and you're having an impact on someone else's eternity? Think about that for a minute. God has given us these gifts and we have different ministry assignments based on the giftings that we have they also shouldn't be a cause of discouragement it'd be wrong for me to look at someone and be discouraged at their gift because I don't have it again God's the one who gave it he wants them to have that gift and he gave me a different one we need to also avoid projecting our gifts on other people you know, it's like, well, I have the gift of administration. You should have the gift of administration. You should have the gift of, we all should have. No, if we all had the gift of administration, what's not going to get done, right? So don't project your gifts on others. And then last one, scripture commands that all believers participate in certain ministries regardless of their gifting. And here, here are just five as an example. Faith, service, mercy, evangelism and giving or generosity those are all spiritual gifts but guess what if you're a follower of Jesus you still have to exercise all these without the gift okay I don't have the gift of mercy I still have to exercise mercy right if you don't have the gift of faith you still have to exercise faith if you don't have the gift of evangelism you still need to share Christ with others so how does this work? Let's, let's drill down on faith very quickly. Faith is, required, faith is required to become a follower of Jesus. We get into the kingdom through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. So faith is required to enter into the kingdom. And then once you're in the kingdom, faith should characterize the life of a Christ follower. 
We should see your faith in your day in and day out life. And then there's also the spiritual gift of faith. And this is when you look at people and they seem to have like faith to the HNL, the whole nother level, right? And you're like, well, I got enough faith to get in the kingdom and I'm trying to live by faith, not by sight, but I don't have that person's faith. Maybe they have the spiritual gift of faith. So we're all required to live by faith. Some of us have the gift of faith. So let's step back out now. Again, you can find all of what I just said in that uh, additional resource. If we think back about the broad category of talents, here's a couple of final thoughts. It's my responsibility to develop my talents to their full potential. If I've been given a talent, whether it's a natural ability, whether it's a skill, or whether it's a spiritual gift, I need to develop it and continue to develop it so that I can become all who God wants me to be, so that I can do all that God wants me to do. And then I've been given my talents for God's glory and for the benefit of others. As I'm exercising my talents, I want God to have glory and I want to benefit others around me. And I love this quote from Eric Little. He's a runner. Some of you have seen this before he says I believe that God made me for a purpose but he also made me fast and when I run I feel his pleasure now I don't know if Eric Little was his running ability just a natural ability was it also a skill it was probably a mixture of both running fast isn't a spiritual gift but as he was who God made him to be as he lived out these talents that he had He was able to feel God's pleasure. So if we just sort of pull it all together, here's the last point in your notes. As a kingdom steward, my primary concern is managing my time and my talent in line with God's priority. That's my primary concern. How does God want me to use and invest the time that he's given me in my life? More specifically, how does he want me to use it today? How can I use my time to advance his priorities? What talents has God given me? There's another resource there to help you ask some questions to kind of think through some of those things. How does he want me to use my talents to be a help and a blessing and an encouragement to those around me? What unique way has he equipped me to play a specific role in the kingdom? Then as a reminder... Here's here's God's priority list that we looked at last week. Number one is the king and kingdom. That's our number one priority. It's not that we can't ever have recreation. It's not that friends aren't important. In fact, we're going to spend a whole week coming up on faithfully stewarding my relationships. But we need to get the priorities in the right order as we think about how we make choices. Because we all have choices and it takes wisdom and it takes discernment in the moment because it is required of stewards that they be found faithful would you bow with me father thank you that you have made each and every one of us exactly the way that you intended to make us you uniquely knit us together in our mother's womb You have given us some natural abilities. Over the time, we have acquired skills. And those of us who are followers of Jesus, you have given us at least one spiritual gift that you intend for us to use in the time that we have on this planet for your glory and your purposes and to expand your kingdom. I pray that you would speak to us, speak clearly to us, Show us the next step that you want us to take. Show us what our best next step is right now. And I pray that you would give us the courage to take that step and then another and another. And as we do, over time, we grow and become more and more like Jesus. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.